Speaking against that selfishness, you know, as, as Brother Larry, as he shared last night, I thought that was so good about the, the deceitfulness of riches. And it, you know, covers a, you know, we just think of being greedy, but it, can co it covers a big area more than just what we normally think of. So, uh, have you been served? Okay. So, we have a confession that we like to say. And uh, so, if you would join with us as we, as we say that tonight, this is my seed. I sow it into the kingdom of God. I sow it because I love God and want to see Family Harvest Church continue to fulfill what God has called us to do, building families that are happy, stable, fruitful, and blessed. I believe that as I sow my seed, it shall be given to me, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, it shall come back to me in many ways." I thank you, Lord, for many opportunities coming my way. I thank you that the windows of heaven are opening because of my obedience to sow my seed. I thank you, Lord, for the favor of God upon my life and the grace to prosper as you have promised me in your word. So, Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, that needs are being met, Lord God. And we thank you, Father God, that, that we... As a church, Father God, that we are a generous church, Lord God, that we, and because we are a generous church, Lord, we walk in your blessings. And so we, I thank you for each and every person in this room, Lord God, that, that they have that desire to become extravagant givers, Lord God, and, and Lord, they'll see the blessing of the Lord. And Father God, as the, as the Bible says, uh, that the more that comes in, the more that we can give out because we understand that God supplies seed to the sower. And so, Father, I thank you. Every need of this house is met, but Father, I thank you every need of their house is met as well. And we give you all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Ushers, go ahead and receive the offering if you would. And thank you in advance. And as I shared, we will be receiving a, a second offering for, uh, for the Huttons. And um, God is good. Amen. Hallelujah. And been wonderful services and revelation and uh, has been flowing. And so as the buckets go by, let's go ahead and stand back up and we're going to worship the Lord some more in music tonight.
What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. Jesus, you. chapter 4 that he's given gifts unto me that Jesus gave us gifts amen and and as you've seen this week that uh, our brother he's operated in the office of a teacher but he's also operated in the office of a prophet as the Holy Spirit has directed him and to bring insight amen and even to bring correction right correction is good at times right well it's good all the time not just at times it is good and, and, and what, what does it help us do? Get back on track, make adjustments so we can do what God's called us to do. So praise God. And uh, so let's give him a warm welcome as he comes once again to minister God's word. Amen. Thank you all. Y'all can be seated. Praise God. Hallelujah. Wow. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Well, sometimes I tell you, you could just go home now and say it was good to have been there. <laughs> what a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus. You know, the name of Jesus uh, 
is all inclusive. It includes every name of the of the uh, names of God under the old covenant. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nissi, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Rapha. I mean, you name every name, and it's all in the name of Jesus. What a powerful name. What a wonderful name. What a beautiful name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, let's open our Bibles tonight to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Doing the first part of the verse, it says, submitting to God. So my question is, what does that mean? What does that mean, submit to God? Well, if you read the previous verse, it said, God resists the proud. That kind of doesn't sound like you're submitted to God then, does it? (laughs) Uh, God resists the proud, but gives what? Gives Grace. grace to the humble. Remember, by grace are you saved. By grace, if you look up the word saved, it's sozo in the Greek. It means saved, delivered, preserved, healed, made whole, all the different parts of salvation. So for by grace are you saved from sin, for by grace are you healed from sickness, for by grace are you prosperous financially. I mean, it's, it's all by the grace of God, which was all accomplished in Jesus at the cross. He bore our sin, he bore our sickness, he bore our poverty, he bore our depression, he bore our bad temper, he bore every curse that came in as a result of Adam's fall. And so uh, it says we have to not be proud or operate in pride because that causes resistance from the grace of God, but gives, God gives grace to the humble. Then it says, submit yourselves therefore. If you see the word therefore, stop and see what it's there for. (laughs) Amen. Submitting to God means humble yourself. In other words, you don't want things your way. You want things God's way. So that's, that's the kind of mindset and the frame of mind and heart that we have to have. And if we do, then and only then... Are you ready to resist the devil? But if you're not submitted to God, I mean, you can holler and resist and shout at the devil all you want to until you're hoarse and all you're going to get is a lack of voice. (laughs) You just won't be able to speak. And uh, he doesn't flee, just may float, throw some fleas on you or something. But uh, said if you resist him, he'll flee, but that's submitted to God. So if we submit to God, then it says resist the devil okay so we're uh, humbling ourselves admitting we don't know it all but God does we want to do things God's way and uh, so we submit to what his word says even when the word goes cross grain to the way we think or the actions that we've had in the past we decide well, we're going to submit to God's word and then we resist the devil but how do we do that so we talked about how to submit to God but how do you resist the devil Well, let's let Jesus be our example. He is our example, isn't he? Let's go over to Luke chapter 4, the fourth chapter of Luke. This is where Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness uh, and then tempted by the devil for 40 days. So let's pick it up here in Luke chapter 1. We want to learn. Remember the Bible said uh, in 1 John, as he is, speaking of Jesus, as he is, so are we in when? In this world. Uh, 1 John 2, 6, we're to walk even as he walked. So if we see Jesus set an example for us, we need to follow in his footsteps, follow in his ways. And remember, we found out it is the ways of righteousness, and the devil is the enemy of all of righteousness. So the devil's going to try and get us to do the opposite of what Jesus did. Because Jesus only said what he heard his father say and only did what he saw his father do. Can I hear an amen? Amen. So Luke 4, 1, Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit. So this is right after the Holy Ghost had come down on Jesus. God had spoken and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And so then he's filled with the Spirit. He returns from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. Afterward... When they, had, when they ended, in other words, when the 40 days were over, it says he was hungry. Let me just stop and kick over a sacred cow here while I'm at it before we go on. 
There has been teaching and still is in the body of Christ that God is going to lead you into the wilderness. That is a lie right out of the pit of hell. That's another doctrine of devil. You won't find it in the word of, oh, yeah, yeah. He led Jesus into the wilderness. The Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. Well, let's see if that lines up with words out of Jesus' own mouth. Let's see if Jesus agrees with that false doctrine. Go over to Matthew chapter 6. And, and uh, Jesus is giving us a model of prayer. We call it the Lord's Prayer, right? Uh, so here in Matthew chapter 6, we're going to read verses 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. Jesus is praying, and this is, he tells us this is how we should pray. He said, uh, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed. That word hallowed means blameless. So you don't blame God. Blameless be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So what's God's will? Whatever God's will is in heaven is God's will on earth. Yes. That blows the, the theology away where God wants some people sick. Right. That's impossible. He'd have to want people sick in heaven. He wants the same will on earth as it is where? Yes. In heaven. So thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into what? Oh, 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 don't. Because, see, Jesus was led by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Lead us not into temptation. Jesus is saying this is how we should be praying. Well, God, Jesus wouldn't have us asking God to do something that it's not his will. Come on. He wouldn't say, now, Father, lead us not into temptation. And God says, but I have to. <laughs> uh-uh. No. Lead us not. We'll go over it. Let me show you. Let me show you. James chapter 1, verse 13. James chapter 1, verse 13. Let no one say. I'm reading from the New King James. Let no one say, when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Now that's pretty plain. That's pretty simple. God, God does not lead you into the wilderness, and he does not tempt you with evil. When Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit to be tempted of the devil, he was doing it for you and me. <laughs> uh, uh, God will not lead you to be tempted. Furthermore, when Jesus... I'll take it a step further. When Jesus fasted 40 days, he was doing it for you and me. God is not going to tell you or anyone else to fast for 40 days. You'd have to prove that in the mouth of two or three witnesses to be a doctrine. You can't do that. So you can't say that. You'd have to let Scripture interpret Scripture. And we found out that Jesus took our place. He came here to suffer and die and take, take our place. And so... Uh, Jesus did these things for us so that we don't have to. Okay, so after Jesus was in the wilderness, fasting and being tempted by the devil, it says, after the 40 days were over, he was hungry. And so the devil brought another temptation. Remember, it says he was tempted for the 40 days, and then after the 40 days were over, he was hungry, and then it talks about three temptations that the devil did these are after the 40 days of temptations out in the wilderness. So it says the devil brought another temptation and then a second temptation and then a third temptation. So what did Jesus do each time the devil brought temptation? And we need to know because it's the same thing you and I have to do. We just read we have to submit to God and do what? Come on, help me out. We have to submit to God and do what? Resist. Resist the devil. So let's see if Jesus did that. Verse 3, the devil said, you probably ought to underline that because he's going to talk in your mind, in your thought realm. The devil said, if, 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 if you are the son of God. I don't think you are, but if, if, just command this stone to be made bread. Still don't think you are, but if you are. <laughs> so see, he was trying to do 
Remember the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life? Remember those of the, that were here Sunday night? We found out that's what he worked on, those three things in Eve. He's trying to do the same thing here. It wasn't just the lust of the flesh, the, lust of the, eyes, the fact that he's hungry and trying to get Jesus to yield to that, but it was also the pride of life. What do you mean you don't think I'm the son of God? Well, I'll just prove I am. Stone be bread. <laughs> Could have done that. Yeah. I'll just prove. No, but he wasn't going to yield to pride. So the devil said, I underline, I underline um, three words in this verse, the devil said. And then in verse 4, I underline two words, Jesus said. The devil said, and Jesus said. Let me, get, let me illustrate. Y'all remember um, when uh, in Mark chapter 5 when um, Jesus had Jairus come to him and say, my little daughter's lying at the point of death. Would you come and lay your hands on her? She'll be healed if you do. And Jesus said, yeah, I'll come. So they were on the way, and then a woman with the issue of blood stops him. You know that whole story. And then when, right at the end of that story, when, when the woman is telling Jesus everything that happened, and Jesus said, well, daughter, your face made you whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. It says in the next verse, verse 35 of Mark, it says, while he yet spake. So while he's still talking to the woman, people came from Jairus' house and told Jairus, don't trouble Jesus any further. Your daughter's dead. Well, that goes against what God said, what Jesus said. Jairus had already put his faith out there. He said, if you come to my house and pray for my daughter, here's the statement of faith. She will live, period. She will. And when Jesus said, I will, then he was letting us know that what Jairus said was the will of God, or Jesus wouldn't have agreed with it. So we know that she will live is a word from God. So then when the news came, your daughter's dead, goes against she will live. So what did Jesus do? Immediately, the next verse says, uses the word immediately, he turned to Jairus and said, don't fear, stay in faith. Don't fear, stay in faith. Don't fear, stay in faith. So when the devil spoke, your daughter's dead, Jesus spoke. Amen. Same thing that's happening here. That's the way you submit to God and resist the devil. You always submit to what did God say, and then you speak what God said, and that will put the devil on the run. So the devil said in verse 4, well, if you're the son of God, command the stone to be made bread. Jesus said, it is written. So what did he speak? Actually, if you look it up, he quoted Deuteronomy chapter, I think it's Deuteronomy 8, 3. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So he quoted the scripture, he quoted the word. The word quoted the word. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> and then next in verses 6 and 7, the devil said, so I underlined those three words. And then he tried to get Jesus to worship him. Verse 8, Jesus said, I underlined those words, <laughs> get thee behind me, Satan, for it is what? Written, and then guess what? He quoted Deuteronomy 6, 13, so twice he's quoted out of the Old Covenant. Of course, you know the New Covenant wasn't written yet, so he always quoted from the Old Testament. And so uh, he said, you'll worship the Lord God only, and only him shall you serve. So he quoted Deuteronomy 6, 13. Then in verses 9 through 11, the devil said, if, still trying to work on him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. In the, and, the, and then the devil even quoted a part of the 91st Psalm. Didn't he? Yeah, the angels will guard you up and you won't even dash your foot against a stone. But verse 12, Jesus said, what did Jesus say in verse 12? God said, in other words, it is written. And you know what he did? He quoted Deuteronomy 6.16. He kept quoting out of, the, out of Deuteronomy, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So every time he was tempted, then he spoke the word. Now these three temptations, we found out, according to the scripture, were after the 40 days of temptations. Meaning it is also showing us that this is what Jesus did during the 40 days. 
because he's the Lord God, he changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if it's showing us what he did to, to submit to God and resist the devil after the 40 days during these three temptations, then we know what he did when he was in all points tested and tempted like us, yet did not yield or sin. So now we see, all right, man, if, if you're going to have an over, live an overcoming life, live in victory, walk as an overcomer, rule and reign in life, you're going to have to submit to God, and this is something you have to do on a day to day to day because stuff happens, <laughs> right? Happens every single day. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 6 with me. Ephesians chapter 6. And let's start reading in verse 10. Ephesians 6, 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and then watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So verse 10 says, be strong in who? Be strong in who? The Lord. The Lord. Be strong, if you look up the Greek, it means to empower. It means to enable. It means to uh, increase. It means strength. It means make strong. But the key here in this verse is not... Try to be strong. It says, be strong in the Lord. In the Lord. Everything is based on who you are in the Lord. Amen. Be strong in who you are in Christ. Be strong in what you have in Christ. Be strong in what you can do in Christ. That's what it's talking about here. In the Lord. In the Lord refers to the finished work of Jesus. It refers to us using our faith in what Jesus has done. That's why he says, you be strong in the Lord. So it's using our faith in what Jesus has already done. Being strong in the Lord and the power of his might does not mean we just do what we can do to the best of our ability. It's not what it means. No, it means that we do what we do based on what he, Jesus, has already done. Did you all get that? Our actions should always be acting like what Jesus has already done is finished in our lives. That's how you appropriate it to your life. Then in verse 11, here in Ephesians 6, Paul instructs us on how to be strong in the Lord. He says, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies. Remember we found out that word uh, wiles, one of the definitions besides trickery and stuff was uh, strategies of the devil. Uh, so uh, it's translated schemes, deceits, tricks, strategies, and plans. But the Greek word actually implies that the devil's going to ambush. The Greek says to lie in wait. So he's waiting for an opportune time to ambush us with some type of trickery, some type of deceptive strategy to try and take us off guard. And that's what we've got to be strong in, who we are in Christ, what we have in Christ, what we can do in Christ. That's the only way you're going to be strong, is in the Lord. And then the next verse, verse 12, God clarifies the source of our struggles and also reveals what channels the devil works through to unleash his attack. So let's look at verse 12. Verse 12, for we wrestle not against people, that's flesh and blood, 
but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. I've heard people teach this to the point where the people listening got afraid. <laughs> but you have to take, take everything in context and then let Scripture interpret Scripture. Listen, if Satan defeated the kingdom of darkness, defeated Satan, defeated every part of his work, then every one of these powers, principalities, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness, high places are brought to zero. <laughs> Amen. So all they can do is try and get you to believe in them and believe something contrary to God's word so that they can usurp your authority and get some of your power working against you. <laughs> we don't wrestle against people. Let me, let me read the New Living. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers, authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So here God lets us know that our fight is not against people. Our enemies are the devil and all of his forces in the kingdom of darkness. However, I saw something else in this verse. It reveals that he says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, which he's telling us then that's who the devil is working through. So we need to know that because if he's human, using human beings to hide behind and to mask his strategies and ambush us, then we need to understand that those people are not the ones we're supposed to hate. God so loved the world. That includes every person of every other religion and everything else in the world. He loves them. You and I are supposed to love them. Love is what God is, and that is so much greater than hate. Love is so much greater than strife and everything else. So Paul goes on in verse 13 and 14. Let me read from the New Living again. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will, you'll be able to resist, King James says, withstand. But, but just so you know, the word uh, resist or withstand, it means in the Greek to stand against. So withstand means to stand, but you're standing against. Against who? The enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you'll still be standing firm. Verse 14, the New Living. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body, uh, uh, the body armor of God's righteousness. Before I go on and talk about the six pieces of armor that are mentioned here, let me share something else that I saw recently. Something stood out to me in verses 11 through 14 here. I'm going to have you underline some words real quick. I'm going to reread it. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to what? Stand. Underline it or highlight that word stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 13 says, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to, may be able to what? Withstand. Withstand or the word in the Greek means stand against. So it's, an, it's stand again. And in the evil day, and having done all to what? Stands, underline, circle, draw your attention to the word stand again. Verse 14, stand therefore, underline the word stand. Now when I was reading uh, Thayer's Greek concordance, this is what stand means, I wrote it down. Number one, continue safe and sound, stand unharmed to stand ready or prepared. Number two, to be of a steadfast mind. Hmm, well, we know where the devil's battleground is, don't we? Number three, of quality, the quality of your life, one who does not hesitate nor waver. So the standing here has to be standing in who you are because you're not going to waver if you're thinking who you are in him, only going to waver if you're thinking about yourself. But remember here, the key is in the Lord. But here's what I saw and what the Lord showed me here oh, a couple years ago. From verse 11 through verse 14, Paul uses the word stand four times. Four times in four verses. Not fight. Go out and fight. No, he said stand. Not, not go get something. Not go earn something. He said stand. And then he tells us to use the armor to stand. So therefore, the armor 
is not, to, not meant to be used to fight a devil who's already been defeated, but to stand in the victory of the one who defeated him. Man, remember Colossians 2.15? Hold your place, we'll come right back. Let me show you real quick. Colossians 2.15, you know this is where it says Satan's been stripped and whipped. Colossians 2.15, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Uh, the contemporary English version, uh, there Christ defeated all powers and forces. Oh, principalities, powers, spiritual weakness, high places, right? He, he defeated all powers and forces. He let the whole world see them being led away as prisoners when he celebrated his victory. <laughs> the Amplified said, God disarmed the principalities and powers that were reign, ranged against us and made us a bold display and public example of them in triumphing over them in him and in it the cross. The new living, in this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. And then I love the message, he stripped all the spiritual tyrants in the universe <laughs> of their sham authority at the cross and marched them naked through the streets. <laughs> Woo, glory to God. See, they don't have any weapons. They're naked. <laughs> Don't have anything to carry. All they have is thoughts. And they try and put thoughts of doubt and thoughts of fear and thoughts of this and thoughts of that, all contrary to God's word. Therefore, here in Ephesians now, Paul is not telling us to fight for what we don't have, but to stand in what we already have in Christ. Man, this is good. Therefore, then he uses parts of a Roman soldier a natural analogy, he uses their gear and their uniform to reveal to us the power we possess, listen, when we are dressed in Christ. That's why I've told people, because I heard people years ago say, well, you know, every morning I get up, I put my armor on. I said, well, I never take it off when I go to bed. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Why would you want to take it off and get attacked in the middle of the night time? Huh? Yes. I've gotten attacked in the middle of the night time, but because I had my armor on, I started laughing. I was in a hotel one time, and all of a sudden I woke up. It had to be 3 or 4 in the morning. I woke up, and I felt a fever. I was sweating. I felt achiness. It was like some kind of flu virus or something trying to come on me. I felt sick in my stomach, and I just started laughing right there in the bed. I didn't feel like it. I felt like dying. Okay, so, so just so you know, if you walk by your feelings instead of by faith, you're in trouble. So I just started laughing, and I had to make myself put on the laugh. You know what I mean? Put on the armor. I mean, I knew I had it on, but I got to put on my, start acting like it, right? Work out your salvation. So I just started going, ha, 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 ha. I didn't feel like it, but I made myself, ha, 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 ha. And a few minutes, it went from ha, ha, to ha, 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 And then a few minutes later, ha, 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 I had to get out of bed and start shouting in the hotel room. Now, I don't know if they called the front desk from the room next door or something. But you know what? In a couple minutes' time, all the symptoms were gone. So I was glad I had my armor on. See, I was dressed in Christ. These are so comfortable, you can sleep in them, baby. All, all six pieces that we're getting ready to look at look at are already ours they're given to us by God and since these are vital in us standing in our victory in Christ then we're just going to take a look and discuss each piece here briefly uh, the first piece mentioned is in verse 14 having your loins girt about with truth now many translations actually call it the belt of truth uh, the belt is uh, of the Roman soldier was a, actually a very thick leather band. Uh, it fit around the soldier's weight, uh, and, uh, waist. And I was thinking, you know, it's possible that Paul mentioned the belt first because it was foundational. The belt is really what held most of the weaponry that was attached to it. So then 
Paul likened it to the truth that we have in Christ. Knowing the truth about who you are, knowing the truth about what you have, knowing the truth that what you can do in him is like the belt foundational to you living in victory. So you put on that belt of truth and you never take it off. And the same verse 14 then mentions the second piece of armor, put on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of a Roman soldier was actually made of strong piece of metal that was uh, really handmade for every soldier. Each soldier it was different. Uh, they made it so it fit every soldier perfectly. It fastened to the upper body, protecting its vital or his vital organs. Uh, and then I see Paul liken this breastplate to righteousness, the righteousness we have in Christ and our identity in him. We're right in him. It protects us from self righteousness it protects us from condemnation it protects us from guilt and shame the breastplate of righteousness you know what it is it is knowing that we are in right standing with God it is knowing that God is not mad at us it is knowing that God's not holding anything against us and counting up at our counting up our sins and it is knowing that we are righteous not based on anything that we have or haven't done and this is a vital part of our armor. Second Corinthians, let's turn there real quick. I'll come right back, so hold your place. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Boy, this is good. Mm. Second Corinthians 5, 19, 20, and 21. I'm going to read from the Amplified, my, my wife's Bible. <laughs> <laughs> she, now she carries the Amplified in a, a, a lighter form. She used to carry this big, giant Bible or I should say, I used to carry her <laughs> big giant amplified Bible. That thing, man, that took up half a suitcase, you know, but anyway. <laughs> verse, verse 19, amplified, it was God personally present in Christ, reconciling and restoring the world to favor with himself, not counting up and holding against men their trespasses, but canceling them. And committing to you and me, us, the message of reconciliation, that is the message of restoration to favor. So we are Christ ambassadors, God making his appeal as it was through us. We, as Christ's personal representative, beg you for his sake to lay hold of the divine favor now offered you and be reconciled to God. For our sake he made Christ virtually to be sin who knew no sin, so that in and through him we might become endued with you as being in and examples of the righteousness of God. What we ought to be approved and acceptable and in right relationship with him by his goodness. Jesus was made sin so that he could make us righteous. Not he met, was made sin so that when we could try and do a bunch of right things and then become righteous. No, yeah. he, he was made sin and when you accept what he did for you, you become what he was before he was made sin. Amen. And that is right standing with God. Amen. Wow. All right, back to Ephesians. And then it goes on in Ephesians 6. Uh, the next piece of armor, verse 15 it says, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Let me read a couple of other translations here. International Standard Version says, being firm-footed in the gospel of peace. That's, that's, that's a good translation. I'm going to explain why here in a minute. Firm-footed. Um, the Amplified says, having shod your feet in preparation to face the enemy with the firm-footed stability, the promptness, and the readiness produced by the good news of the gospel of peace. Now, that's, that's a little different than a lot of people have uh, tried to interpret this gospel of peace, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Many people have said, well, that means, you know, you take the gospel and you preach it. But notice what the Amplified said, having uh, shod your feet in preparation to face the enemy with the firm-footed stability, the promptness and the readiness produced by the good news or by the word of God called the gospel of peace. The New Living says, for shoes 
Put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. Mm. Actually, I, when, I, when I studied out the Greek words used here for preparation, the preparation of the gospel of peace, the, and then the context that's here, I saw that Paul was not talking about going out and preaching the gospel of peace like he did in Romans 10, 15. You know, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace? That's not what he's talking about. What he's actually implying here is that the gospel of peace is what we're standing in. Oh, yeah, Romans 5, 1. We are justified by faith and therefore have peace with God, right? And so he's actually implying here the gospel of peace is what we stand in and it prepares us to walk by faith, not by sight, no matter how bad it looks like. That's having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And so I, I looked at the, the, the shoes of the Roman soldier was studying out. They were actually made of a leather sole with bands that wrapped up around the ankles. Uh, made, and, and then the bottom of the shoes were either made of uh, sharp stones or nails uh, to help the soldier stand firm-footed without slipping. Uh, so, so when Paul uses this illustration, he says, likewise, because you are in Christ, then you stand in supernatural shoes. You're not standing in your own. You're standing in your, these God-given shoes, and, and they have God's writing on them. Amen. These shoes that you have don't have some celebrity's name on them. Jordans or LeBrons or whatever. No, they don't have celebrity. And they don't have some famous shoemaker's name on them. You want to know what your shoes say? Gospel of peace. Amen. Yeah. And most of you know what the word gospel means. It means good news. That means we are standing. Oh, this is so good. The Lord showed me this. I, I, I forgot to tweet it. I was going to tweet it. The, le the Lord said... You're standing in good news when you're facing bad news. See, we're standing. Whew, glory to God. I mean, isn't it good to know I'm saved when I don't feel like it? I'm standing when I face contrary stuff. Isn't it good to know I'm standing in Jesus and I'm healed when sickness is coming against me, bad news? I'm standing in the good news even when I'm facing bad news. Glory to God. The Greek word here for peace means to join peace. It means prosperity. It implies peace, quietness, and rest. Um, and it's a verb. <laughs> a verb means there's action involved. So, so I'm using these shoes to join to Jesus. I'm going to stand in that peace. I'm going to, I'm going to prosper. I'm going to have quietness and rest that God's already given me because I'm in Him. And then I looked up the word feet shod, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The Greek implies firm footing and firmness. Firm foot. Well, you're only going to have firm footing and be firm when you're standing in Christ. You're in Him, what He's done for you. So this is talking about standing in this kind this God kind of peace right in the midst of attacks from our enemies. So just like the sh soldier's shoes gripped the earth beneath him, giving him stability and strength to stand against his enemies, our gospel of peace shoes, that's what I like to call them, our gospel of peace shoes will help us stand in Christ and stand in the victory that he's already won for us. Amen. We stand calm. We stay in rest. We keep our minds and emotions quiet and peaceful. We prosper in all our ways, even when we've done all to stand, we keep standing firm in the good news of what Jesus has already done for us. Man. It's like you just want to stop and say, Selah. Because we which believe enter into rest. And every one of these pieces of armor is so that you can rest and stay in faith, not get into fear, not get into doubt, not get into no blame. And the way you rest is, what did Jesus do? What Jesus already did, the finished work of Jesus. All right, so the next piece of armor Paul mentions is the shield of faith, 
Uh, reading from the New King James here, it says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts. How many? All the fiery darts, or we found out it means spears or arrows, uh, but they are lit up with fire. They're meant to burn and hurt and destroy and kill. All the fiery darts of the wicked ones. So when Paul compares our faith to a shield here, I want you to understand, again, he's using Roman uh, attire, Roman battle gear, and he's not talking about a small or even a medium-sized shield, not the little round shield like often we see in the movies. When I studied this out, the Roman shield of that time was called a scutum. And if, if you look at the scutum, it was more of a, almost the size of a door. <laughs> it was huge. Uh, now, you've probably seen that in some movies because in some movies you see the warriors whenever they're being attacked, they all of a sudden get together, position themselves where all of their huge shields produce an enclosure around them, if you've seen those. And so it becomes a vital part of armor for the enemy or for the soldiers because it's the first barrier against the enemy's attack. It's like a blanket of protection against the enemy. And that's what God is saying here uh, about our faith. We're supposed to use this faith in our marriage, we're supposed to use this faith when facing, uh, facing financial problems. When we're supposed to use this faith when you're facing physical challenges. Every situation, emotional challenges, everything, you're supposed to use this. In fact, I like the uh, English Standard Version of this verse. It says, in all circumstances. That kind of sounds like every test and trial we're going to face, right? In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. So all circumstances, whether facing financial, physical attack, or great temptation to yield, or attack against your marriage, of your feelings, whatever, it says, uh, use this shield of faith. So Romans 12, 3 says, every one of us have been given faith by God. And even a little teeny tiny mustard seed measure of that faith is enough to move mountains out of your life. Right? It protects us with unwavering confidence. That's what his faith will do. It, it protects us with a blessed assurance. The kind that stands up and say, God's got this. Not I've got this. God in me. God's got this. I'm just going along for the ride. God's got this. He's got my back. He's got my front and sides too. <laughs> my God's got this. In fact, hold your place again. We'll come back. Go to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. How many of you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Amen. All right, look at 1 John 5, 4. It's a verse written just specifically to you whoever is born of God so did you raise your hand yes. so this is written to you you could put your name right there Larry is born of God Larry overcomes the world and this is the victory that Larry uses to overcome the world even Larry's faith and even Larry's faith is not of himself it's a gift of God Amen. can't boast yeah. whoever is born of God overcomes the world and this is the victory that overcomes the world even our faith so he lets us know first of all a more generalized statement in the first part of the verse whoever is born of God overcomes the world that means all the different things that the world is going to throw at us all the tribulation remember Jesus said in the world you'll have tribulation so the world's going to throw all these things at all the different areas of our lives trying to defeat us but then he gets real specific. Now he says, now when you have the world throwing something at you, here's how you get the victory of that. You've already been designated as an overcomer, heavyweight champion of the world, already got the title. But now you got a battle here. So now I'm going to talk, I'm going to go uh, from you've already won, you're already an overcomer, but now you, got, you are going to face a little battle. So now here's what you do use your faith. Yep. This is the victory, because you'll get the victory. Isn't that good? 
God says, man, I'm, I've already called you an overcomer. Why? Because he already overcame the world for us. And we're in him, so we're going along for the ride. We've got the victory. Thanks be unto God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So I've already got the victory. Praise God. Let's, uh, let's go on back to, to um, our next piece of armor in Ephesians here in, in the 17th verse. Take the helmet of salvation. You know, when soldiers went to battle without helmets, the most fatal wounds on the battlefield were head wounds. So this was a vital, vital piece of armor to the Roman soldier. Let me read, read, uh, read something I wrote down. I, I got this out of uh, some history when I was studying the history of the Roman soldier. It says this. It says the Roman helmet, known as a galea, could vary, quite, uh, could vary quite a bit in its design because they were all created individually. And through the time of the Roman Empire, there were numerous changes made to them, so they had different variations and designs. But most of the time, they were made of strong metal or leather with metal reinforcement. And also, they were beautiful, very ornate designs engraved into them. They covered the head completely, including the cheeks and jaws, and were so strong that not even an enemy battle axe could penetrate it. So Paul is actually using this type of description when referring to our minds and thoughts, which is what this is, this helmet. So... And, of course, we know the mind is the devil's battleground, right? He brings his thoughts, and we're supposed to do what? Bring them into captivity. Hold your place again. Let's look at that verse real quick in 2 Corinthians 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. See, when we have our minds renewed to the Word of God and where we're just thinking God's Word all the time, then it's going to be impenetrable. The devil can throw every fiery arrow and shoot fiery spears and everything else trying to get you out of peace and out of joy and into fear and into doubt, but it's not going to work if you do what it says here. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, I'll read from the King James, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity captivity every what thought to the obedience of Christ in other words to the word of God so this is how this is how we uh, use the helmet of salvation the helmet of salvation of course salvation I heard um, T.L. Osborne give this definition a couple decades ago he said salvation is the sum total of all the blessings of God bestowed on man by God in Christ through the Holy Spirit Salvation is the sum total of all the blessings of God bestowed on man by God in Christ through the Holy Spirit. So it's not just being saved from sin. It's being saved from sickness. It's being saved from poverty and lack. It's being saved from PTSD. It's being saved from in any curse you can mention. It's being, we've been saved from it. So, um, so this says uh, we bring every thought captive so that it obeys Jesus, Jesus the Word. So how do we do that? Well, we do that with the helmet of salvation. I noticed back here in Ephesians, go back to Ephesians just a minute, when, when mentioning all these pieces of armor, notice um, five words. Take the helmet of salvation. It's the shortest description given to any pieces of the armor. And that would suggest that almost no explanation is needed. You're standing in Christ, and his salvation alone is all you need to be thinking about and giving your attention to no matter what battle you're facing. Spiritual, physical, financial, emotional, marital, what? What are you thinking? Are you using this helmet of salvation that you have? 
and that'll keep your mind and thoughts and emotions stable and secure. You know, Paul said in Philippians 4.8, you don't have to turn there if you don't want, but Philippians 4.8, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's just, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's reputable, whatever's virtuous, and whatever's praiseworthy, meditate on these things. He listed eight things that are a part of our salvation helmet. <laughs> wow. Actually, if you look up the word salvation that's, that's used here, the helmet of salvation, the word also means in the Greek, defense. Defense. So it's the helmet of our defense because it defends you of thinking wrong thoughts and getting you out of faith. And then defender. So when you have this helmet on, you're thinking who is your defender. <laughs> so that keeps you out of fear because you're again focus, focusing on Jesus right in the middle of a storm. Instead of getting afraid, you lay your head on a pillow and you take a nap. <laughs> right? So all eight things that are mentioned here are part of our helmet of salvation or our defense of uh, our defender. Uh, this helmet of salvation keeps and our thoughts on Jesus. Acts 4.12, there's no, there's salvation, I think it says there's salvation in no other. If you could put Acts 4.12 up for me. There's salvation in no other, uh, God has given no other name under heaven. Yeah. Neither is there salvation. We're talking about the helmet of salvation. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So what does that mean? In other words, my helmet of salvation, I know that my salvation is based completely on what Jesus did for me. It has nothing to do what I've done for him. Salvation is by grace, through faith, period. Or we could say exclamation point, <laughs> whatever. So this helmet of salvation is another vital part, but it's just, it's resting in Jesus. It's all about him. If we can just, be like Colossians say, you know, I'm dead. My life is hid with Christ in God. Well, dead people don't react to anything. <laughs> if you're dead to self, then the only way you'll react is, how did Jesus react? What would Jesus do right now? How would he treat this situation? How would he act? How would he do? All right, let's go on to the next next uh, piece of armor that Paul mentioned in Ephesians 6, 17. And take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So, so the sword was both a defensive and offensive weapon, right? Uh, obviously, it's a defensive weapon because it could stop, you know, it could block swords, it could block other spears that other soldiers are using to try and kill you so it protects you from being hurt or killed. But it's also an offensive weapon. It could wreak havoc on somebody, especially when you uh, study the Roman sword. The, the Roman sword was commonly, most of the time, a two-edged sword and was sharpened to where it could penetrate and cut not just flesh but bone. So it was, right, we would say, razor sharp. So you remember Hebrews 4.12? that God's Word is alive, quick, powerful, it's living, it's active, it's full of power, and it's a double-edged, remember King James says two-edged, a double-edged, what does that mean? It's got two sides and they're razor sharp. God's Word, razor sharp. And, and so the sword of the Spirit is piercing. And uh, you can use it against the devil to stand in Christ. And um, so you're virtually saying when the devil attacks you, using both edges, I know who I am in Christ. I know what I have in Christ. I know what I can do in Christ. You're not stopping me, devil. What are you doing? You're, you're putting the devil on the run. Why? You're submitting to God and resisting the devil, and he flees. Submit, resist, and watch him flee. Submit, resist, and watch him flee. Submit, resist, and watch him flee. But, but also, in addition, when you use the sword of the Spirit, according to Hebrews, uh, you might use it to speak into other people's lives. And Hebrews 4 says here that it pierces their hearts. It reveals their motives, intentions, and feelings. 
And according to the context of Hebrews 4, it helps you and others get into rest. Wow. Resting where we cease from our own works, where we rely totally on Jesus' works, and then grace is able to flow to us and our lives and then help us and the others that, that we're trying to help when we speak the word. So what are we supposed to do? Stand. Stand in it. Stand in what? Stand in the belt of truth. Stand in the breastplate of righteousness. Stand in the shoes of peace. Stand in the uh, shield of faith. Stand in the helmet of salvation. Stand in the sword of the Spirit. And every one of those are standing in the finished work of Jesus. Who you already are. We are dressed. I like to say it this way. We're dressed in God clothes. This is God uniform. This is God clothes, man. And you know who we look like? Jesus. Yeah, when you're standing in Christ, guess who you look like? Man, you are outfitted (laughs) to the T. You are outfitted to live and walk in victory. What an outfit, huh? (laughs) And then we're ready to do verse 18. And let's just use this tonight to... uh, uh, Well, I should say I'm fixing to close. Verse 18 then says, when you have all this armor on, then praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplicating for all saints. The New Living says, pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert. Be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. The New International Reader's Version says, at all times, pray by the power of the Spirit. Pray all kinds of prayers. Be watchful so that you can pray. Always keep on praying for all of God's people. Of course, the only way you can do that is praying in the Spirit because you sure can't pray in your understanding for all of God's people, right? God's had, a, had you and us pray for other people that we have no clue we prayed for, and when we get to heaven, we'll find out. They'll come up and thank, thank you for praying for me. I prayed for you. I don't even know who you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, God prayed through you. You prayed in tongues and... I was one of the mysteries that you prayed for. Wow. So let me go over as a closing um, these, these eight things that we're supposed to do um, when we resist the devil. It says, be on your guard. Be steadfast with your faith. Don't give place to him. Cast him out. Stand against him. Use your authority over him and always use your faith as a shield. So we're to resist the devil, James 4, 7. Submit to God, resist the devil. The New Living says, so humble, submit yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Number two, we're to be on our guard against him. We used our foundation text, 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Number three, we're supposed to resist him steadfast with our faith. That was the next verse in 1 Peter 5, 9. Resist him steadfast in the faith, and you're supposed to do it knowing that the same sufferings that you're experiencing, the brotherhood in the, the, brotherhood in the world, they're going through it too. So don't let the devil lie to you. Nobody knows what you're going through or you're facing it alone. No, bless God. And remember, you're standing in Jesus. You've already got the victory. That's why you've got to be steadfast with your faith. Number four, we're to give no place to him in our lives. Ephesians 4, 27, neither give place to the devil. Remember what we found out that word place means? Don't give, uh, don't give place, don't give a spot, don't give space to him, don't give a position to him, don't give him a home, and don't give him an opportunity. That's what we saw, what I think it was Sunday night. Number five, we're to cast him out. Mark 16, 17, cast out devils. That doesn't just mean out of somebody that's possessed. That means when the spirit of infirmity is coming against your body, a spirit of fear is coming against your mind, or any other devils that are coming against your life, your marriage, whatever, you cast them out. Don't let them stay. Don't play with the things of of the devil or kingdom of darkness. Why? He'll get an advantage over you. He'll get the upper hand. He'll snare you like a trap uh, set for you, and then he'll be able to steal, kill, and destroy Number six, we're to stand against him. We saw that in Ephesians 6. Uh, stand, 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 right? But we're standing against him in this that 
Jesus already defeated you. I'm in Jesus, so I've already got the victory. And I'll use my righteousness, and I'll use the word, and I'll use all the things, the, the pieces of armor, because I'm standing in Jesus. Number seven, we're to use our authority over all his power. Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give to you power to tread on every devil, demon, evil spirit, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So um, we're to do that. And then number eight, we're supposed to use our faith as a shield to stop all of attack, all of his attacks. Can I hear an amen? amen. Was this all right tonight? Amen. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's just uh, worship him just a minute. Thank you, Lord. Father, thank you so much for reminding us of things maybe we've let slip, uh, bringing things to our remembrance that you've said to us before, um, showing us things that we've maybe not seen and getting new light, Father God, but uh, revealing to us that we do have an enemy. He is a liar. He is a deceiver. Uh, he is an enemy of all, un all righteousness. And Lord, he's defeated. You've loosened us from his works. You've put him underneath our feet. You've given us dominion and authority over him. And so, Lord, help us to, to take the word now that we've heard for these last four days and help us apply these words, apply these scriptures. And, Lord, help, make, help us make, um, make us aware when, whether it's in our finances or in our marriage or in our physical health or in our emotions, whatever, help us to be aware when the devil is flying stealth, when he is trying to work undercover. Lord, let the word shine the light on him trying to come against us. Uh, and Lord, we, that's our responsibility is to stay full of the word so that that light will shine. And so, Father, thank you for showing us. Thank you for revealing to us. Thank you, Lord. I believe you found a group of people right here in Cheyenne, Wyoming. We're not going to just be hearers. <laughs> We're going to be doers and blessed in our doing according to James 1, 25. Thank you for that, Lord God. Thank you for that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We worship you now, Lord. We worship you. What a beautiful name. What a beautiful name, Lord. Oh, what a beautiful name. The name of Jesus. Mm, 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 mm. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. What a wonderful name the name of Jesus. What a powerful name, the name of Jesus. There is no other name under heaven given among the, that we have to be saved or healed or delivered or prospered or set free. No other name. So we'll use that name. You said we are called by that name. That's because we're in Him. And in Him is where we truly live. In Him is where we really, really move. And, and even have the very essence of our lifestyle, our being. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Yes, sir. I want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit tonight. Good. Meaning that you're a Holy Spirit tonight. Good, good. Amen. Well, why don't you come on up, bro? Man, that's a good thing. And if there's other people, that want to be filled with the Spirit, that's a good thing. You know, in other words, if you, you can pray in your known tongue, that's what the Apostle Paul said. He said, I don't just pray with my understanding. He said, I pray with my spirit, which he says it's not understood by my brain. He said, my understanding is unfruitful. In other words, Paul said, I really don't have a clue what I'm praying when I pray in tongues. He said, but my spirit by the Holy Spirit in me prays. So that's what's so cool is when we get baptized in the Holy Ghost or he, he called it a number of different things, being baptized in the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, being filled with the Spirit. Um, so that's so good, it's so good. And every one of us, this is a good reminder, even maybe if you are already filled, I try and remind people that are filled with the Holy Ghost already that if you've been slacking in praying in the spirit and let me tell you it's easy to do I'm a preacher and sometimes I'll find oh man I, I went all day without praying in tongues I don't like doing that because then all you're doing is just going by what you know yeah. instead of being able to pray in the spirit and pray out divine yeah. secrets and mysteries things he knows 
I mean, that's how Liz and I, we've noticed through all the years, and I know you guys have done the same thing, and probably you guys in your own personal lives, many things that we prayed in the Spirit, and then God would give us interpretations of, of not the whole thing, but being able to see, oh, you were praying about this, this, and then years later see it come to pass because God gave you the words to speak by the Spirit and plant that seed so that harvest could come down the road. And so then we're seeing ourselves walk out things today that we prayed out in tongues years ago. That's, that's the cool thing about praying in the Spirit. So, uh, does anybody want to come join us when we're going to pray for him, let him get filled? If you want to come and get filled with the Spirit, come on. If everybody's already filled, then we'll get him filled. <laughs> Praise God. Anybody else want to come? Anybody else, you're, everybody else filled with the Spirit? If you come on up, you want to get filled, come on now. Or forever hold your peace. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anybody? Hallelujah. All right, so do you think it's God's will? Amen. <laughs> you, you must have heard enough yeah. already, huh? Right. You, you've already heard scriptures yeah. and see that, that if, if you ask for the Holy Spirit, God's not going to give you a serpent, is he? Not going to give you a devil or demon. Yeah, that's in the scriptures. So uh, we've, we've got God's word on it. Now, here's the good thing about being filled with the Spirit. It's no different than being saved by the Spirit. It's by grace through faith. So you have to use your faith to accept Jesus and get born of the Spirit. Same thing when you're filled with the Spirit is you have to use your faith. So you don't walk by feeling. And that's where I think most people have gotten messed up is they walk by their feeling and by their intellect, by their knowing. In fact, I, I'm just going to have to tell off on myself here a minute. When I got filled with the Spirit, um, I had the same desire as my brother here. I had been hearing, I'd been sitting under a good pastor at my church, started reading all the scriptures, and every single time in the book of Acts, every single time, which was five, six different times, in the book of Acts, when people got filled with the Spirit, they spoke in tongues. So I knew it was part of being filled with the Spirit. And so I remember when I got filled, I got filled in the most unlikely place. I was on the way home from Delta Airlines where I worked for years, and I stopped in the Methodist church at midnight. It's where I'd grown up, so I still had a key to the church even though I'd quit going there. But I had a key to the front door, and so I went to the front door, walked up to the altar, and I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in that Methodist church at the altar. But now here's what I did. Can everybody see me? Let me get up here where you can see me. It was so funny because I... I, I needed taught, I guess, but I was like so many people. They think that when you get filled that God's going to make you talk in tongues. That's what people have thought. And so a lot of people, their head gets in the way. Well, I don't feel anything, and so I guess I'm not filled with the Spirit. Wait a minute. You receive it by faith. That's right. I didn't feel anything when I got saved, but I knew I was saved because God said so. Yeah. So if you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit by faith, then guess what? You're filled, and guess what that means? You can now speak in tongues anytime you want. Yeah. Just like you can speak in English anytime you want, right. or whatever your known tongue is. Yes. But telling off on myself, here's what I did. When I'm standing there, I just, Lord, I, I use my faith right now, and I receive, by faith, I receive Jesus as my Holy Ghost baptizer. Jesus, thank you for baptizing me in the Holy Ghost. Thank you for filling me with the Holy Ghost. And I thank you now that I can speak in a new heavenly prayer tongue. And then I went like this. I did. I went. And I heard this still small voice. And since I was the only one in the church, I knew it wasn't a person. When I opened my mouth and went, I heard the Lord say, what are you doing? And I said, I'm waiting for you to talk in tongues. No, none of the verses in the Bible said God talked in tongues. It said they began to speak. And so God said, you can't talk in English by just opening your mouth and not using your tongue and speaking. You can't talk in my language or your language if you just open your mouth. You have to use your tongue, your own vocal cords and everything. And then God said, then because you're doing it in faith, I'll give utterance to myself and it'll be supernatural. 
And so it's just like any language, you know, I started speaking a few different weird sounding words that I didn't know what they meant, but, but I just started speaking them. Of course, you know what the devil does? How many of you have had the devil jump on your shoulder and say, you're just making that up? Most of us, right? Oh, well, why? Because he doesn't want you talking in a language he doesn't understand. You're talking in a divine language and the devil lost all divinity when he got booted out of heaven. No longer the bright morning star. No, more, no longer Lucifer, right? Now he's the defeated one. He's the uh, liar and deceiver. No, no light at all, all darkness. So he doesn't want you talking in tongues because, man, that's between you and God and he can't get in on it. So I'm saying that not just for him tonight because there's some of you that have been filled but you haven't been praying in tongues. And I know it by the Spirit, so we need to be shoring ourselves up in these last days. We need to be praying in the Spirit, praying in tongues, all right? So, reach your hands out toward our brother. And uh, you, brother, just repeat these words after me. Let your heart agree with it. You just receive. You just say, God, God, I come to you right now. I come to you right now. In that blessed name of Jesus. In the blessed name of Jesus. Of whose I am. Of whose I am. And whom I serve. And whom I serve. I'm already your child. I'm already your child. You already live in me. You already live in me. And I live in you. And I live in you. So right now. So right now. I use my faith. I use my faith. To receive. To receive the infilling, the infilling of the Spirit of God. Of the Spirit of God. Jesus, Jesus, I receive you. I receive you as my Holy Ghost baptizer. As my Holy Ghost baptizer. And right now, and right now, by faith, by faith, I am saved. I am saved. But I'm also filled. But I'm also filled with the Spirit. With the Spirit. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' and name. And I can talk. And I can talk in a heavenly prayer tongue. In a heavenly prayer anytime, tongue. Anytime. Anytime. Anywhere. Anywhere. That I'm at. That I'm at. Including right now. Including now. Now I'm right going to ask now. everybody in here just go ahead and talk in tongues. Yep, there it comes out of them. Now stop just a second because I heard you talking in tongues, but I want you to get a hold of this. You can start, and, and the reason I'm saying this, there's some false teaching out there that says you can't talk in tongues unless you have some special feeling. No, you don't have to have a special feeling to say hi in English. <laughs> you don't have to have some special feeling to roba lebo. You can talk in tongues, pray in tongues, pray in the Spirit, as Paul called it, anytime, anywhere, in the shower, in the car, when you're driving, when you're in bed, anytime. The more you do it, you'll develop that language just like you developed your known language. You couldn't speak it all at once. The more you pray, the better it'll become, the easier it'll become. And listen, when the devil jumps on your shoulder like he has all of ours and says, oh, do you know what you're saying? Just tell him, no, but God does. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen, brother. I love you. Thanks, brother. Praise Thank God. Glory. Woohoo. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Praise God. Come on, let's lift up our hands and thank you. Thank you, Lord, for filling our brother with the Holy Spirit tonight. Hallelujah. What a wonderful gift. What a wonderful thing. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And if you're there out watching in, in uh we could say spirit land, you know, because you're watching over the air. Thank God. If you're watching and you haven't been filled, do just what we just did with him. In fact, I hope you did it while we prayed with him. But if not, do it right there. Because I did it by myself in the Methodist church at midnight. So you don't have to have anybody pray. Just lift up your voice and say, Jesus, fill me with the Holy Spirit. And by faith right now, I receive it. Once you receive it, you know you got it. So you might as well just start praying in tongues. <laughs> praying in the Spirit. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Worship, we worship you. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You know, through Jesus' death, he defeated the one who had the power of death, that is the devil, and then delivered us through all our lifetime, we're in bondage to fear. Fear brings bondage. Worry is fear. Stress is fear. That's all bondage. 
And we were subject to that. We were subject to that bondage. But when Jesus came and defeated the one who had the power of death and then delivered us, we're free. We're free from the enemy and we're free from all of his wiles, his trickery, his arrows, his fiery spears, whatever he throws at us, we're free. So you got to keep reminding yourself of those things. Stay full of the word of God. Stay, keep that in mind. Remember what Isaiah 26, 3 says? God said, I'll keep you in perfect shalom, perfect peace if you keep your mind stayed on me. Boy, that goes right along with what we were seeing, the devil's battleground. He wants you to be thinking wrong things at wrong times. And remember, he doesn't want you to know it when he's doing it. So it's, it's trying to fly stealth. He's trying to stay undercover. Don't let him do it. Go ahead and just shine the light of the glorious gospel right to him. Submit to God. Humble yourself. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee. Thank you, Lord. Lord, is there anything else you want me to say? Anything else you want me to do? Hallelujah. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Well, I'm clear in my spirit, so Liz, you got anything, honey? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, I'm going to do my announcements a little different tonight, do it like I did last time I was here. I'm going to wait till after past, pastor's going to come and receive a love offering for our ministry, and then I've got some things to give away. So I'm going to give away some stuff. Is that all right? Yeah. I know my family here likes free stuff. <laughs> so after he, after he comes up and receives the love offering for our ministry, and remember I challenged you guys, I know maybe some of you haven't done it yet, so if you haven't made that special offering, that you know, double up, triple up, whatever you're going to do. If you're going to give zero, then triple it. <laughs> no, if you were going to give a dollar, triple it, give three. If you were going to give 10, triple it, give 30, whatever. Just give a special offering because we're going to take it and we're going to reach souls all over the world and, and uh, everything's expanding in our ministry. I just love the way God's doing it. You're sure not me. I, I tell you, I just keep... I, I, tell God all the time, God, the way you keep expanding our TV program and we're reaching people, you know, like we're missionaries to just many different nations now, different people that are getting the word of God. And uh, I, I, In fact, just this last week, I got two or three messages from uh, one from uh, a believer in Pakistan that said, man, I've been impacted by your ministry. Another by, um, um, where was the other one at? Afghanistan. I think they were all, oh, not, not all of the Muslim nations. One that wasn't a Muslim nation, but people are getting the word of God because, you know, we know the prince of the power of the air is trying to dominate the airways. Well, bless God, we're doing the airways with God's word, right? Yeah. And so you partners are helping us do that. And so thank you for being a partner tonight. And I know one or two of you said you're going to be, be new partners this week. You told us that, so thank you for wanting to partner with us and help us out. And God will, God will bless you for it, that's for sure. So, Pastor, come on, and then I'll come give some stuff away. Praise Amen. God. Praise God. Wasn't that awesome tonight? Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's just go ahead and, and serve the people. If you need an offering envelope, if you just raise your hand up. You know, you see, he likes to give away free stuff. He didn't give away the golf game the other day. So, <laughs> and, and I just I, I just did. I just get, I just popped into my, into my mind. Uh, let me just read this. I know we've heard. He shared with you, you know, what they're doing. We've seen uh, the ministry gift uh, flow over these uh, uh, five services. And if, uh, Philippians chapter 4, or chapter 1, verse 4, says, Whenever I pray, and this is out of the New Living Translation, I make my request for all of you with joy. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news of Christ from the time you first heard it until now. Well, we've been hearing the good news about Christ. Amen. And, and it's not just Jesus saves in the sense of just being saved from our sins. But I love that tonight. We're in Christ. And so everything we have in Christ, we stand in that. Amen. And, and so um, just, you know, he's already shared with you. And, and so we partner with him. 
and helping him as he goes forth. He's going to be going uh, uh, down to Houston. He's going to be going down to Florida and, uh, and some other places ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and we get to share in that. Amen. And the same truth that we've heard this week that, that I know. Uh, I mean, you know, when you sit up here as a pastor, you sense the, the people grabbing hold of that truth and it bringing freedom in their hearts and bringing freedom in their minds. And, and you know how, uh, as your pastor, it blesses me to, to see that and to, and to sense that going on. So, hallelujah. Yes. It's been awesome. Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Why don't you hold your offering up, if you would, and, and why don't you say this? Say, thank you, Father, for the Word, because it's the Word that sets us free. And I receive that Word, and I will act on that Word, and I thank you. Then I have an opportunity to give and to be a blessing and to partner with so that the good news of Jesus Christ, of who we are, of what we can do, of where we can go, that truth is settled in our hearts. So we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, come and receive the offering if you would. And thank you. I uh, he's going to share, uh, um, you know, about uh, his products. So uh, they'll be out there afterwards. So come back up. Hallelujah. Liz, come up here. Let's just pray for them right now because, you know, many of them have given every single service and then others came and the service they came, they sowed into our ministry. So let's just release our faith right now for supernatural grace to abound financial grace to abound to every one of you that are sowing so father right now liz and i set ourselves in agreement and pray over the offerings that are given tonight and all the other services this week lord you said that he that sows bountifully would reap bountifully lord you said that when we purpose to be cheerful givers you said all grace all financial grace would abound and so right now we're speaking financial grace Grace, 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 prosper, prosper, prosper over every single sower. And we thank you, Lord, you give seed to sowers. So because they purpose into heart to be sowers, you're going to give them more seed to sow and more bread to eat for themselves as well, more blessings in their lives and more, more money to give. Lord, they're blessed to be a blessing. And we call it forth and agree together now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So thank you. Thank you for partnering with us during these meetings. And then thank you, those of you that are monthly partners that are helping us uh, reach people. You know, every month I, I, I think about you when I sit down. I'm serious, man. I think about different names of you that are partners when I'm sitting down writing the partner letter. I said, Lord, help me write things that you want them to hear this month. How many of you are partners of our ministry? Let me see your hands. You're partners of our ministry, monthly partners. Uh, have you enjoyed the letters? Because, man, they're personal. They're, they're right from the heart of God. I don't just, you know, try and say something just to say something. I, I pray and seek the Lord. So uh, thank you. And those of you that are not yet partners, if you're considering becoming one, um, that's what we're going to do. We're going to partner with you just like you partner with us. We're going to help you. We're going to sow into your life. We're going to pray. Uh, pray, and we pray for you regularly as well, and so uh, we're in this together. And then everywhere we go, uh, every soul that's saved and every life that's changed, you're going to be getting a reward laid up in heaven for you as well. You'll, you'll be partakers of our grace. And so uh, thank you for being a partner, and thank you uh, for those of you that are praying about it, because we do need more partners. You know, just like a church, the only way a church can keep growing and keep reaching more people is for people to tithe and give, right? And so it's the same way with the ministry. We need monthly partners to help us and get out and reach more people. And all of us build the kingdom together, right? Yes. I mean, you know, one can put a thousand of light, two can put what? 10,000. So you see, the more that you have together, a threefold cord cannot be easily broken. God just lets us know that the more of us that are working together, the more we're going to accomplish for God. So thank you. Let me give some things away here. Here's my little book, Limitless. 
And um, this one is just so good. If you, if you like witnessing to people or if you want to give it to somebody that you know is a baby Christian and that need, just really needs some mentoring, maybe they won't come to church with you or something, you want to get it in their hands, man, get limitless life with Jesus. So who'd like to have this one? Okay, brother, back in the back. Come on up here. Hallelujah. And this is really good for believers too. If you're a believer and want to get uh, your fire stoked, I'll tell you, that'll do it. Praise God. And then I've got the series called He Was, I Am. Hmm. Most people go through life thinking that they are who they are according to their circumstances or their heritage or their background or their failures. Hmm. But that's not, that's not who God says you are. That's, that, that's not what dictates your future of who you are, what you have, and what you can do. And so this is over five hours. Uh, this is, to me, the most crucial teaching in the body of Christ worldwide that needs to be taught is so that people will grow up and be in Him, and that's what it's all about. So who'd like to have that one? All right, I saw her hand right back there. There you go. God bless you. You're welcome. Then I've got our Heaven's Health Food. Now I noticed some of you were, who, who, let me see a show of hands, who does not have Heaven's Health Food? Just put your hands up real quick. If you don't have Heaven's Health Food, I knew there's quite a few of you. And some of you weren't here when we announced last year, but last year we let everybody here know that we had a couple that had terminal cancer. Both the husband and wife had terminal cancer at the same time. She had stage four and he had stage three and the doctors had given them up to die. And, said, you know, we can give you chemo and, and uh, radiation, but it'll only maybe extend your life six months or something. So they decided not to do it. They started seeking God, and they were not uh, people that went to a church like this one. They went to a dom denomination that knew nothing about God's will to heal. But God led them to start searching on YouTube. They ran across our YouTube channel, started watching me preach on the subject of healing, and then they ordered this Heaven's Health Food CD. And all this is, for those of you that don't have it, it's just a whole hour. I don't preach or teach. I just quote scriptures from the Bible on healing and health. They both started listening to it. Remember, terminal cancer now, six months to live. They both started listening to it day in, day out. Like I think they said they ran it 24 hours a day. But they were listening to it all the time, and all the cancer disappeared from their bodies. And then six months later, they're standing in front of Liz and I at another meeting because they heard we were going to be close by about an hour away. They came to our meeting, introduced themselves to us, and said, we took no medicine. We took no um, medical treatments. We were totally healed by the Word of God. So that's what this CD is all about. Who'd like to have that one? All right, sister, here you go. Praise God. And you guys, man, that don't have it, that's that you want. The devil attacks your health and your finances regularly. That's why in 3 John 2, God said, Beloved, above all things, I'm praying that you would prosper and be in health even as your heart and soul, or heart and head prosper. He said, man, he said, this is going to be the area that I need to pray for you, your money and your physical health, because the devil attacks those two areas so much. So get a hold of those. And then I got our deck of cards back here. This is a prescription for health cards, where it's a whole deck of 52 cards, one card per week, where I have a scripture on the front of the card, and then on the back of the card, I have my personal confession, because a lot of people say, now, I, I, I've read the scripture, but what am I supposed to say? So that way you can kind of have an idea and then you can make it your own and change it, whatever. But uh, it's 52 cards. Just take one card a week. Take it every, every day for seven days in a row. Make it your scripture. And I'll tell you what will happen. The first couple days when you quote it 60 times, you'll memorize it. And, and then it'll start going past memorization. I'm telling you, by the end of seven days, it won't be a part of your memory. It'll be a part of your being. And that's when you know the truth and it makes you free. So let me see, who wants to have this one? Um, I was going to say this. Does anybody have a birthday this week? Any birthdays this week? Birthdays this week or next week? Birthday next week. Any birthday? All right, here, bro. All right. Happy birthday to you. There you go, man. All right. Praise God. Anybody want my iPad? Don't lift your hand. I'm not giving it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Well, wow. It, this came quick, didn't it? 
we could go on. We could go on. I, rem I remember doing meetings like this in years gone by, and you get done on this last night, and it's like, wow, we've just gotten started, haven't we? I believe we'll get back to those days. We'll start a meeting, and we won't want to quit, right? We'll just, okay, well, let's come back tomorrow night. Let's come back the next night. Praise God. Honey, you want to say anything? Got anything you want to say? Sure. All right. Well, we sure love you guys. Thank you for treating us like family. And uh, Chavez's, thank you for loaning us your car while we're here. I didn't wreck it, I promise. And, uh, so thank you for loaning us your car. You know what? Just that, you know, a lot of times when I do financial freedom seminars, and usually I'll take one service about how to get creative in your giving, and I'll talk about different people that have bought their pastor a new car or people that have sewn a car for us to use rather than renting a car. When you think about that, they sewed their car for five days into our life. It equals between two to $300 that they sewed because that's how much I would have had to spend on a rental car. Yeah. So they sewed not just the monies they gave here, but they got creative in their sewing. And so, man, just pray. Ask God, Lord, help me be creative in sowing toward my pastor and sowing toward my church. If you have some special ability, like, you know, let's just say you're a, a tax man. Man, offer to do their taxes for free so they don't have to go pay hundreds of dollars to have them done. Whatever, you know, I'm just saying get creative. If you own an auto repair shop, say, Pastor, you're never going to have to pay for another repair. I'm taking care of it for you. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Just use your abilities and skills and different things to sow as well as your money. Amen. Praise God. Let's all stand up. Pastor, come on up here. Yes. Hallelujah. Sure Praise love this man and woman. They're yeah. wonderful people. Amen. Call them friends. Yes. But we're thankful we stand together in the ministry. Amen. Working yes. together, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Amen. Love you. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, there. there we go. Hallelujah. Now, uh, this coming Sunday. It was you. Okay. It was turn, him turning off his mic. You, you weren't awake, you, or if you aren't, you are now, right? Um, I didn't remember what I was going to say. Oh, uh, uh, Pastor Linda and I, we're going to be gone. We're uh, doing a uh, get-together with my siblings. Uh, so uh, pray, pray for her. <laughs> and their spouses. We're going to Memphis, and uh, some had been playing way back at the beginning of the year we uh takes us a while to get everything together and uh we're all over the country and so pastor gill's going to be ministering but i asked him to continue on this series on faith and reason and and so i know he was sharing with me last night a little bit and uh he's ready to go and it'll be good he's gonna uh, talk about uh jesus uh, lord lunatic or liar and just kind of give you a little uh, uh teaser there and so come on out and, uh, you know, doing this series is helping us to learn how to defend our faith and, and to share the hope that we have with other people and uh, strengthening our faith. But then, you know, when people come to us with challenging questions and we can give them the why of why we believe what we believe. Amen. Praise God. So thank you. Uh, good crown tonight. And uh, I know many were touched, many blessed, you know, uh, uh, go buy out the product table and, uh, you know, then we don't have to send anything back. Hallelujah. And, and let me just share this real quick. Um, we have, uh, I know, I think we just ordered like 10 or 15 of the wealth, um, uh, the wealth scriptures because we give those out. And if you're needing healing in your body and you don't have one of those, uh, just see either myself or, or Lori. She's back there. Bless her heart. She's been working on her computer trying to get it to work right. But if you would like one of those and, uh, you know, you're, you're battling sickness in your body, uh, just let us know because we'll, we'll bless you with that. Amen. Well, Father, we, I speak a blessing. I, I speak a blessing over this congregation, Lord, and I thank you for them. Thank you for their hearts. Thank you for uh, uh, them receiving, Father God, uh, of what you have shared through through. Um, Brother Larry, Father God, we just thank you for that, Lord. And just as they go, Lord God, they'll put into practice what they have heard. So we give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.